to today, talk about today, is some of the tasks, well, or, organic and sustainable gardening. And some of you know me, and I have a passion for organic gardening. You know, I don't believe for the home gardener, it's necessary nor wise for us to use a lot of synthetic chemicals in our garden. Uh, any chemical that you use in your garden, whether it's organic or not, if you use it according to the label, it should be safe to use for you and the environment and wildlife. But it's better to use uh, organic principles in your gardening. And we're going to talk a bit about that. And also like talk about sustainable practices that you can do in your garden that require less inputs from off your property. Um, but a big part of what we're going to talk about are fall gardening chores. I'm going to kind of wrap those fall gardening chores up with organic and sustainable gardening practices. We're not going to get through this whole thing, I don't think. <clears throat> Um, we're going to do the first half of it probably, but you've got the information. There's resources in the back that can help you, and we'll go we'll go as far as we have time to go. I always have more stuff to cover than I have time to cover it because I really love this stuff and love talking about it. And uh, so, with that said, anybody have any questions before we get started? Okay. And we have how many master gardeners are in the classroom right now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wonderful. And hopefully, maybe all of you guys will be master gardeners one day. Mm -hmm. It's really not as intimidating as it sounds. Uh, okay. <clears throat> there we go. You want me to stand over there? Um, so first of all, just a little bit of background about organic gardening, and then we'll get, in, get into some other stuff. Anybody have any idea of what those, that group of, a, of 12 fruits and vegetables has in common? I know somebody here probably knows. Anybody have any idea? Okay. There's an organization called the Environmental Working Group, and every year they publish, every year they actually publish a list of USDA and FDA tests on fruits and vegetables. And they rank them from those that have the highest levels of residual chemicals to the lowest levels of residual chemicals. And you can go to the website and look at the whole list. Um, what they do, they, they pull out of that list what they call the Dirty Dozen every year, which is a place that kind of rhymes, Dirty Dozen. Remember the old show, the way back in the 70s, the Dirty Dozen? But uh, they pull out the top, the top 12 uh, fruits and vegetables with the highest levels of residual chemicals on them and publish that as what they call the, the Dirty Dozen list. Um, and if you go back to that list, you'll see that almost half of that are fruits. And so the the foods that require the highest level of chemicals generally to grow the food group are fruits. Apples, uh, peaches, pears. Um, it takes a lot of chemicals to grow those, those fruits. Uh, they can be grown organically and are grown organically, but you don't find a lot of organic fruits that are out there. Uh, typically you find commercially grown or, or uh, conventionally grown fruits. You have to look for the organic ones. If you're concerned about your intake of chemicals, unnecessary chemicals, then one place to start reducing your intake of unnecessary chemicals is to go to that list, and you can look it up. You can do a web search on that. Pull their, they've, got a gro they've got a grocery shopping guide, which has those top dozen most uh, foods, fruits and vegetables, with the highest level of residual chemicals. And they've got what they call the Clean 15. Again, it rhymes. And it's the 15 vegetables and fruits with the least amount of residual chemicals on them. And it's kind of a shopping guide. So you can go to that, download that, and use it. So if you want to reduce your intake of, of unnecessary chemicals, and maybe you, you, for whatever reason, aren't able to buy everything organically, then focus on these 30 dozen. At least buy those organically, and then everything else, you know, conventionally, that's what you want to do. <clears throat> okay, what is organic gardening? And this actually comes out of a uh, UT Extension publication that I believe is out of print right now. And we need to see if we can get that back in the print. It was out of print last time I checked. So this is actually UT Extension's definition, but I pulled the reference off uh, for the publication number because it, the last time I checked, it was out of, out of print. Organic gardening is a system of gardening that you, attempts to utilize only sustainable, ecologically sound gardening practices, rejects the use of artificial pesticides, rejects the use of chemical fertilizers, and focuses instead on building, building basically building your soil. That's what gardening is all about. It starts in your soil. And if you don't have good, rich soil with lots of life in the soil, you're not gonna have a good garden. 
Another reason to consider organic gardening, this was a friend of mine shared this report with me. It was a 2010 report by the President's Cancer Panel entitled Reducing Environmental Cancer Risk, What We Can Do Now. And so that body of esteemed scientists and researchers published this report. And out of the report, it says exposure to pesticides can be decreased by choosing to the extent possible foods grown without pesticides or chemical fertilizers, i.e. organic food. So the more organic food you consume, the fewer chemicals you're, you're consuming around those foods. And let me say too that the FDA sets limits for residual chemicals on foods that are safe to eat. So I'm not saying that you're gonna, you know, your arms gonna fall off if you're if you're not eating organic food. I'm saying that even with those limits that are set, you're still uptaking a certain amount of chemicals every time you eat food grown grown up conventionally. And you can reduce that by growing by eating things that are grown up. Thanks for coming in, folks. We're just getting started. And by the way, if anybody has any questions, let's keep this casual. And if you got any questions, throw your hand up and holler at me. Uh, if you have something to add, yes. I'll well, ask now because I'll probably forget. Okay. When you're do, I'm trying to do a um, uh, compost. Thank you. We're, we're going to come to compost in a minute. Oh, okay. But Go ahead. If you're store buying some of these things on the list mm -hmm. and putting them in your mm -hmm. pile, is that? That's not going to be an issue. There, there's not enough there, and it's going to break down in, in the process of your compost actually breaking down. So that's not a concern. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question, though. That comes up a lot. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Other reasons why you know organic gardening, careful use of synthetic chemicals or organic chemicals in your garden, because you can, if you don't use things according to the label, you can cause a lot of harm to life in your garden, including. This little, I guess that doesn't show up on this. Right in the middle there, those are green beans. And right in the middle there's a tree frog. And what do tree frogs eat? What do frogs eat? Bugs. Which is, he's in there basically cleaning up bugs that are eating our vegetables. Uh, also, who knows how frogs breathe? Through their skin. Through their skin. So what happens if you spray that frog accidentally with some kind of, some kind of a chemical? Okay, he's going to absorb that into his body. This is a, and I still don't know what this is. I see it a lot. If anybody knows, let me know. It, it's some kind of a, uh, a flying insect. Do what? Are they like stink bugs or something? No, no, that's a flying insect okay. right there, and it's a predator insect. Okay. And he's, he's actually caught. He's actually caught another mm. insect, and he's in the process of eating the thing. So I see those a lot in our garden, but I, I haven't quite figured out what he is yet. It's not a dragonfly or a damselfly, it's something different. So I guess the message is that there are lots of organisms, animals, insects in your garden that are helping you control pests. And if you, if you use a broad spectrum pesticide and you kill every insect in your garden, then you're killing ladybugs, walking sticks, uh, prey mantises, um, you're killing things like this, you're killing uh, tree frogs, uh, American toads, whatever it might be in your garden. So there's a lot of carnage caused on wildlife. Bees, honeybees, by um, just the, the, the broad use of broad spectrum pesticides, whether they're organic or, or synthetic. So care should always be exercised. Always read the label, and we'll talk about that if we have time, too. OK, now just another couple of quick things about to think about with organic gardening. Um, can you tell that I like organic gardening? Is that, are you all picking up on that? Um, Many synthetic pesticides and fertilizers have been documented to cause a significant reduction in soil life and fertility, as well as causing accumulation of salts in the soil. Healthy soil is going to have a lot of macro and micro organisms in it. It's just going to be teeming with life. If, if a soil that is heavily doused with continuous applications of synthetic pesticides and fertilizers is not going to have as much life in it, because they just can't withstand that. Uh, so really, you should, you should focus on building and feeding your soil and let your feed soil your plants. And I think what we're taught by a lot of the chemical industries is that you should go buy this, this, this liquid concentrated fertilizer and pour it on your plants and your plants take it immediately up through the leaves and through the stems and through the roots. Really, you should feed your soil. And your soil then produces the nutrients that your plants need taken up through the roots. It's a longer process. Okay, so let's, let's, let's cover a couple of things that, that you should start looking at right now. This is a perfect time.
to start uh, planning for your garden next summer, next spring. And we'll talk a little bit about things you can do this fall and through the winter as well. Um, seed catalogs. I highly recommend that you go on the web, find some of the prominent seed catalog companies, go ahead and get on our mailing list and start getting some seed catalogs from them. It gives you a lot of more choices of seeds. They have every seed catalog will have a section called agronomics, which covers very succinctly in very good detail, but very readable, how to grow that particular crop. And you can look for disease resistant crops, you can look for heirloom crops, you can look for unique things you might not have grown before that you can discover and really have fun with. So I highly recommend that you start with some seed catalogs and now is the time to get on their mailing list. Uh, some that I really like, Seed Savers Exchange, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, and these are in your handout. Um, seeds of the South, Seeds of Change, Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, one I use a lot, Territorial Seed Company, D. Landwood Seed Company, and Johnny's Selective Seeds, another one I use a lot. You can find good selections of seeds here at some of the retailers and some of the garden shops, but you're going to find more information in your lap with a cup of coffee in the morning or in the evening, reading through that seed catalog and learning about some of the different varieties. And then you can order from them or go buy it locally, one or the other. Now's a good time to get a soil test done. Uh, you, may have, may, you may know something about that, you may not. Uh, you can pick up a soil test kit here. I think there's some at the information table, or there usually are. If not, the main ag extension office, up the big building up at the front. It's very easy to do. Doesn't cost much. I forget what it costs. What, eight, nine, ten bucks? Okay. And there's instructions on there on how to collect your, uh, your soil samples. So go to your garden, your flower bed, your lawn, whatever you're interested in. Collect several samples from different places of soil, mix it, dry it real good, get the sticks and stones out, put it in that box, fill out the form, bring it here, they'll send it off, and you'll get back an analysis of your soil that will tell you what kind of fertilizer, if any, you need at what rate. Now, the, the recommendation is generally geared toward a synthetic fertilizer. And again, I'm preaching organic gardening. There are a number of resources you can use to convert that synthetic fertilizer recommendation to an organic fertilizer recommendation. And what do you mean? we're going to have to come to that in a minute. If, if it's in the back of your handout. I forgot that I, it's toward the back. But there is a, um, there's a section in the back on, on two sources, and hopefully we'll get to it, on converting. One is converting an inorganic fertilizer recommendation that you'll get in your results to an organic fertilizer. You can build your own fertilizer. It's easy to do, it's not expensive, it's real simple. It's very simple. That particular one is put out by um, George Extension Service. So it's an extension publication, it's online, you can download it. It's really easy to do. You can buy the constituents locally. Most of them would come from Farmers Co-op, and others might come from a TSC store, or maybe a big box hardware store. But you can assemble the ingredients you need and build that. So we'll try to get to that. Uh, there's another one by a guy named Steve Solomon. You've also got that one in reference to that. It's not necessarily converting an inorganic fertilizer recommendation to an organic one. It's just a straight organic fertilizer. That's the one I use. It's very easy to build. doesn't have many constituents. The, part, the, the, the various constituents are easy to find. You put it together, and that's the only fertilizer that I ever add to my garden. I, only add, I don't add as much as he recommends. I add less, and I only add it when I plant and I don't add any more throughout the growing season. And I can do that partly because I spent so much time building up the soil. Soil, I've got it, it takes time, but I've got it pretty rich. And I'm adding this organic fertilizer as well. And I don't, I don't do any other fertilizer at all. Is that fertilizer, did you get someplace else or do you make your own fertilizer? No, I make my own, both, both those and they're- So your compost? Let me tell you where, and, and the compost. Okay, so it, you, get, you make that plus compost? Yes, plus compost. Oh, really? Um, Okay, on page seven, yeah. in the middle box on the right, under fertilization, okay. just in case I don't get there, okay. there's two, two sources of recipes for homemade organic fertilizer. The one I use is the first one. It was published first in Mother Earth News. That's a, you can go there, you can download that, you can type a search in on that. It's really an easy organic fertilizer to make. I really like it a lot. Under that, uh, Let's see, toward the bottom is one by George Extension. Where is that? Okay, it's on the left, the middle box on the left on page seven. 
the bottom bullet. Everybody find that? Okay. And we'll try to get to that, uh, but it, it's it's really easy to do. Can I hear one more time on your organic fertilizing and whatnot? This is good for like the, the vegetable garden, but my berries, blueberries, are acidic. That's a really good question. Uh, you can use this for your berries, but leave out the lime. Leave out the lime. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> That's a good question. You don't want to put a lime on anything that likes acid soil. Okay, one thing that you guys might want to do now, how many of you have gardens right now? Okay. And if you're like me, everything's pretty spent, it's, it's worn out, you know, things are looking bad, it's getting toward the end of the season, except for your cold season crops that are just starting to come in. As you start pulling things out of your beds and freeing up beds, and if you've got beds that are going to be idle for the winter, most of us have, we're going to have one or more beds in our garden that are going to be idle for the winter. We're not going to be growing anything. Sow a cover crop on it. Um, some good things to sow are clover, oats, uh, winter peas, hairy veg, cereal rye, things like that. These are things that will grow and thrive in the winter. Get them sown now. Uh, before they go to seed, go ahead and cut them down and turn them under with a hoe. You can also till them in. We'll talk about tillers in a minute. I personally don't need a tiller. There's the reasons why you're better off once your garden's established working with a hoe rather than a tiller. And we'll talk about that in a minute too. So you can use cover crops um, to help you start preparing your soil. So when, when you cut that and it dies, it's going to decompose and add organic matter into the soil. There's also going to be a, a wide network of roots in the soil from the plant that are going to die and really add more organic matter to your soil and loosen it up. <clears throat> and clover is especially good as a cover crop. Why? What does clover add to your soil? Nitrogen. nitrogen. So you're actually pumping nitrogen into the soil. And some people will use clover because of the nitrogen fixing capabilities, but also add something else, like maybe a cereal rye with it, which they just use two different things, and add, you're adding two different kinds of nutrients into your soil. One more to caution about clover. Clover is a fairly perennial plant. Um, it's you have to work at it because you want to kill it. You want it out before you start planting. So you're going to have to chop it up. You know, don't spray with Roundup. Just <laughs> chop it up and turn it under. But it takes a little more work to, to get that. Well, I'm really worried about that. To, yeah, and, and if you are, don't use it because it, it does. So it is. I planted white clover this summer as a cover crop. Mm -hmm. And then it looks all the same when I try and get out the rest of the year. And I thought, oh, have I done a, myself a disservice? <laughs> Do what now? Run, run that by me again? Well, I've got it covering. I did it as a summer cover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it's, I've it's, not tried to turn it in yet, but it looks just like what I try and keep out of the garden. Oh, I know, I know. And, but you'll, you'll, it takes more work, but you'll be able to chop it up, turn it in, let it rest, and then see what re-sprouts and chop it up. Mm -hmm. It takes a little more work, but it's a good cover crop. Well, the vetch I read, and I think I'm going to try mm -hmm. this winter because they said we're well, going to have tomatoes yeah. it is definitely an annual yeah. so you just mow it mm -hmm. and then plant your tomatoes and it's a mm -hmm. nice mm -hmm. kind of living or not living dead kind of like kind of like no till farming keep the weeds yeah. away you can plant right shoot. in there yeah so i'm excited yeah. about that good point um you can also add if you don't want to do that you can add um, about two inches of organic matter so what's organic matter Anybody compost? Okay, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. If you don't, you should. It's easy. And there's no point sending your organic matter to the landfill when you can put it back in your garden. Um, you can use shredded leaves uh, in the fall. You know, leaves are going to start falling soon. Uh, you can, believe me, you cannot gather too many leaves. So if, if you really want to add organic matter to your soil and build up your soil, you know, go, you know, how. In the fall, we all rake our leaves, and most people put them in bags, just brown bags, and put them on the curb. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm one of those people that goes around driving through town picking up those bags of leaves. I do the same thing. And, do, and, and oh, yeah. stockpile, you cannot get too many leaves. So I would <clears throat> go driving around picking up bags of leaves if you don't have enough in your own yard. Well, I've heard that before. I was going to do that. Then. Do you just like till them in to the There's, chunk soil? A couple of things. One, the best thing to do is if you can shred them. Now, you don't have to, but it's better. One way to do that is pour them out on the ground and run them over and over them and wreck them back up. There are also these leaf shredders you can buy. It's like a weed eater on a stand. 
It's, it has a hoop, you attach a bag to the bottom of it, it's got three or four legs. There's basically a weed eater head, <clears throat> and there's a chute. And most of the hardware stores sell those. It really makes it easy. They're not terribly expensive, but you just pour your leaves in there, and that weed eater's going around and it chops them up. Is that like a uh, chipper? It's different. A chipper shredder is different. It's, it's heavier duty. A chipper shredder will actually, you can use that, but it will actually chop up limbs and sticks and things, small limbs. Yeah. This is really just for leaves and things. So there is a chipper shredder that you can use. You can also, one of our master gardeners also came up with an idea of, of pouring the leaves in a garbage can, put on some goggles, put on some earmuffs, and get your weed eater and stick it down in there and turn it on. <laughs> I got that solution. Yeah, that's pretty good. And that's go, pretty good. You can go to Home Depot and you can get one. Looks like a looks like a leaf blower. Yeah. yeah. But it's in your Shredder, yeah. yeah. So there's different you ways. Go around and weed eat. Weed if you can get your leaves to ready. Easier. Well, mine was a regard can. So I'm good. And it's it a works. cheaper yes. than those shred leaf shredders. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that works too. But basically, ideally, you want to break those leaves down some. They're going to break down faster. You're jump-starting process. You can also just pour them out whole on your garden. Just, and you might want to lay some sticks and things over them so they don't blow away. And they're going to slowly break down. Uh, and then toward the end of the season, start chopping them in. So you can do it without, um, you know, without shredding. You can also make what's called leaf mold, which is kind of like composting. The best way to do that is to, to get some kind of a piece of fence, uh, you know, three or four feet tall, wire, chicken wire, or something, like a hoop, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, about four feet in diameter, and pour your leaves in there, and just agitate them every now and then. It's kind of like composting, but it's just leaves. And they're gonna break down and make what's called leaf mold. So we'll look at that too. So anyway, um, cover crops, now it's time to do that. If you don't wanna do cover crops, uh, start adding organic matter and compost. Composted manure from horses, cows, chickens, um, shredded leaves, grass clippings. A lot of people use grass clippings to make sure it's from a chemical free lawn because in this case, somebody has a question about chemicals on food as far as composting, that's not a problem. Chemicals on grass is a different thing. Some of the chemicals used to control weeds on pasture grasses and in some cases on lawns are persistent and that they will, that chemical will survive the composting process and when you put it in your garden, it will start harming your plants. So. Uh, Chemical free lawn and a, and, and a weed seed free lawn. If you've got a Bermuda grass lawn and it's already gone to seed, you mow it, do not go rake up that mulch and put it in your compost because you will be seeding Bermuda grass all over your lawn. So just be careful with grass clippings. But they work. Lots of people use grass clippings. Uh, straw, wheat straw, do not use hay. Uh, everybody doesn't farm, or everybody doesn't come from the country. There's a difference in hay and straw. Wheat straw is basically wheat, and it's gonna be a light colored product. That's all it's gonna have in it. When you put wheat straw on your garden <coughs> um, as organic matter, and then you turn it in, it's gonna really help, help break up the soil and add, add organic matter into your soil. But in the spring, you'll get some wheat seeds germinating, and that's not too big a problem. You can turn them under and get them out and just let them grow. Don't add uh, hay. Hay will have all kinds of stuff in it. And all of that, all kinds of stuff is going to germinate. Uh, so stay away from hay. <clears throat> um, coffee grounds. Most coffee shops, uh, most of us drink coffee. Uh, it's keeping me going this morning. Um, if, you, if, if you drink coffee, you put your coffee grounds in your compost or put them around your garden vegetables, put them around your blueberry bushes. Yeah. It's really good. Around your azaleas, holly trees. Uh, coffee in your compost, uh, in your garden beds directly. You can also go to coffee shops and get big bags of the stuff, which is good. Um, so in the winter, you're adding, you're adding some or all of this to your garden over the winter as a cover crop or as just um, organic matter added to the soil. You don't want that open soil just lying there collecting seeds. So when we get around toward late winter, start turning it under periodically and you're getting ready to plant. This will be a lot maybe February right before you start looking at planting some of the early crops and start working it up. It's working into the soil, preferably with a, with a hoe. Okay, let's talk about composting for just a minute. How many people compost again? Okay, what do you use to compost? How do you compost? Is it a bin, a pile? Uh, old fence. Okay, inside a fence? Mm -hmm. Okay, kind of like a... Like a um, pallet fence. Yeah, okay. Who else compost? Um, I got a bin, I bought it. Okay, and it's got a crank on it so you can turn it. Those are cool. I have, uh, I call it the Darth Vader. It's 
Yeah. The black dome thing? Yeah. Okay. Who else? I have a couple of garbage cans that I drilled holes. Yeah, that works. The Mark Murphy method. If you've seen one of Mark Murphy's presentations. I used garbage cans too, and then I just kind of pull them across the lawn. Okay. That works. Anybody else? My students, I just got three piles. That works. Did I need anything? That, that works. That we'll talk about we'll talk about that. You can do it any way you want it. Compost is gonna happen one way or another, no matter what you do. But it's a really important way of collecting rich organic matter to add back to your soil that you're gonna to have to do something with anyway. It's your stuff you're taking to the curb in terms of, of shrub clippings, leaves off the lawn, um, garden waste or vegetable waste out of your kitchen. You're either putting it in the garbage can or you're taking it to the curb, and there's just no sense in that. It's just as easy to put it in the pile and it compost. Um, it's also, if you're into recycling, it's the ultimate recycler. You, know, it, it's, you can't get any more pure recycling than that. So just very briefly, and I'm not going to give a detailed thing on, on doing compost, just some high points. But if you haven't seen uh, one of our master gardeners, Mark Murphy, he does an incredible presentation. He's like a compost guru. If you ever get to see a, a program by Mark Murphy on composting, if you ever see it listed, it does it periodically. It's, you'll be entertained and you'll be informed. It's a very good program. Um, so, so essentially you're going to collect, uh, and we're, we're going to talk about kitchen composting primarily, but you can also compost when you um, prune your edges. You can compost that, uh, limbs, leaves, whatever. But we're going to talk about primarily right here, things out in the kitchen. So you've got uh, vegetable scraps, uh, banana peels, orange peels, uh, you know, whatever you've got left over from produce that you're using. And it needs to be collected somewhere. Most people will put something under the kitchen sink. It could be a pickle jar, a coffee can. Uh, I tend to like, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, I tend to like a stainless steel composting bucket, and I'll show you why. But it doesn't have to be. Just somewhere to collect the stuff with a lid on it. And then periodically when it gets full, it will take it down to your compost bin. Um, so this is a, a stainless steel composting bucket. Uh, I know the world market has them. I think Target has them. Uh, you can find them around town. What I like about this is inside here is a charcoal filter that you can take out and dispose of by new one. It's got holes in the top. So what it does is lets moisture out, but not odors. Because you're putting some pretty uh, moist stuff into your compost bucket. And it gets pretty nasty if it's closed up and can't breathe. It's going to get kind of nasty anyway. That's just the nature of, of, of collecting compost under your kitchen sink. But, I like this layer because it lets some of the moisture out, but doesn't let the odor out, and that filter can be changed. And you'll see these also, they look just like this, they're ceramic. I do not buy one of those, because you will break it at some point. Um, this is stainless steel, it's bulletproof. So that's a good way to start. So you're gonna need it somewhere at the compost, and you can do it in piles on your property, that's gonna happen just fine. That's how composting originally started, things were just piled up. And after a period of time, you're going to have compost. Yeah, I turn mine frequently. Mm -hmm. And you get there pretty pretty quickly then, I guess. Yeah, I get real quick. Yeah. If I was not going to class, I put a little bit of clabbered milk on it. That's the low tech way of doing it, and that works just fine. Um, so some of us like to some of us like to clabbered milk, you know, sour sour milk, yeah. like yogurt. Or... Mm -hmm. Some of us like to to build things that contain the compost. Um, you can do that too. You're going to have to have some place to put it, either on the ground or build you a bin of some kind. And I'll show you a couple of those in a moment. Um, it can be as simple as piling chop yard waste and grass clippings, leaves, and garden waste in the corners of your yard. Add kitchen scraps to it occasionally to mix it. You've got to have a mix of what are called brown and green substances. I'm not going to give you a list of that. You can go look it up. Uh, green are things that are, that are recently alive. Uh, banana peelings, lettuce, old lettuce, uh, leaves. Anything like that are called green substances that you're going to add. They tend to be moist, moisture rich. You're also going to need uh, at least about twice as much carbon as you're going to have. And that would be like shredded leaves, uh, straw, shredded newspaper. Those are the carbon elements. So you need to mix those two things to have compost really happen well. And I would just encourage you to go to look at composting, greens and browns. And you'll get a really nice list you can print off that tells you what's green, what's brown, and roughly a two to one mixture. Roughly. Uh, do you discriminate in your newspaper? Like, I won't use anything that's got color in it. Uh, good point. Uh, I do shred newspaper sometimes if I don't have anything else to add. If I've run out of leaves and I haven't got a bale of straw sitting there or a wood straw sitting there, 
then I'll go shred a newspaper and put it in there, but not the color because of potentially some of the additives and some of the ink. <clears throat> Your compost pile or bin needs to be about three or four feet tall and about three or four feet wide. It's got to have enough mass to build up enough heat to start cooking. And you're looking for a temperature of about 140 degrees. And if you do it right, you'll get there. <clears throat> so some different ways of doing it. Uh, the pile, I don't have the pile specific to this, but that's the easiest way. Like a pile somewhere, every now and then turn it and make sure you're mixing those grains and grounds. Uh, a wire bin, I think you mentioned a wire bin, which is just chicken wire, fence wire, or something, and a hoop about four feet wide, and just start piling your stuff in there. Once you get it, the neat thing about those is, is once it gets full, then lift the wire bin off, set it over here, and then shovel everything back into it. And that's turning the compost. It's easier than trying to reach in there and turn it. Uh, pallet bin, uh, if you ever go to Pinterest and look up pallet projects, it is amazing what people are doing with pallets. And I don't want to get started on a tangent there, but um, I love pallets, recycling used pallets and all kind of neat stuff. Pallets make great compost bins, and I'll show you a picture in a minute. Uh, the, best, the best system for composting, if you really want to get into it, is a three bin system where you've got a bin, say on the left, where you start putting raw materials. You fork that over to a bin in the middle, which is partial decomposed materials. Then you have a finishing bin. So stuff goes in on one side, works its way to the other end, and the other end is what you're using. So you're constantly moving stuff through that system. I'll show you that in a minute. I've also got a composting barrel. It's a plastic uh, food grade barrel. If you want to use a barrel for composting uh, or for water harvesting, make sure it's a food. It had food in it and not petroleum products. Uh, be careful about that. Um, if you do a barrel, just drill it full of hose. Just as many hose as you can get in it without it falling apart. If you get too many holes, it'll come apart. You don't want that to happen. Um, and then a wood slack bin, which is kind of like a pallet bin, but it's built out of dimensional lumber, piece by piece. So here's a um, barrel. You mentioned, one of you mentioned rolling a garbage can around. Barrel's the same way. <coughs> Just be sure and drill this thing full of holes. These, the Rutherford County Co-op always has these in stock, almost always. Um, they're like uh, $30, $25, $30, and that's it. It's a composting bin. You're going to pull a half inch diameter hose, put a few hoses on the top, and put some hose in the bottom so it can dry you. And then when it comes time to mix it, just lay it over and roll it around the yard. My neighbors think I'm nuts, but it works. Oh, by the way, if you've got kids, or our neighbors have kids, put them to work. <laughs> so here's a three bin uh, compost station. This one's built out of dimensional lumber. Uh, you could also do that same thing with, with uh, wood pallets. And then here's the wire fence bin. It could be chicken wire, or it could be whatever kind of welded wire fence this is. Just something with, where the opening is close enough to contain the leaves. This one, again, you know, the material goes in here. Once this fills up, you're going to fork it to the middle. So then you've got partially decomposed material. Then you start refilling this. Once this fills up, then you're going to fork that one over here and that one in here. And that's your ending, your finished product. So it's kind of, you're continually moving stuff through the system. This one, when it gets so full, you just lift this off, set it aside, and then fork the material back into it, and you're turning it. In this case, that's, that's basically making leaf mold right there. It's only shredded leaves. And so here's a uh, pallet bin. Uh, that's, I thought that was a three bin system, but it must be a two bin. So it's very easy to do. You can find all kinds of instructions on the web. Where do you find the pallets? They're everywhere. Um, you can go to big box stores, Home Depot, Lowe's. Uh, and just ask? Building sites, just ask. I mean, every, you'd be surprised how many pallets there are laying around. They're, they're everywhere. And just, just look, just be looking and ask. Okay, there are a couple of things. Um, you do want to try to get, you don't have to have a compost thermometer, but it's fun. Uh, it, it looks like a meat thermometer, but it's about that long. And you just shove it down into your compost bin. It'll tell you what temperature you're at. And you really want to try to get to about 140 degrees. <clears throat> That's when you really start breaking things down and you're killing some of the weed seeds that are going to be in your compost. Um, it's kind of fun just to see what you're doing. So it'll reach a temperature of 140 degrees or so, and then it'll start cooling off and the temperature will fall down. That's when it's time to turn it. That's when everything inside is cooked, but the stuff on the outside isn't. So at that point, you want to turn your compost and get stuff that was on the outside back to the inside. Um, you might also find, I remember the first time I discovered this, this isn't a compost bin of mine. 
and grass clippings and stuff in there. But I don't know if you can tell, these segmented flat worms, they were everywhere. And I thought, oh my God, what have I done? What is this stuff in my compost bin? And so oddly enough, I was talking to a guy here at the farmer's market and he, he was really into this. He actually had on his, his iPhone, he brought out, video of his, of his bugs in his compost. He was so excited, he'd researched them and they're black soldier fly larvae. And so what they're doing, they're basically digesting the material in your compost bin and breaking it down. And then once they molt out of this phase, it becomes a fly that flies away and leaves this behind. And then I did some research on them and I found out that uh, EPA, Army Corps of Engineers and others actually use these black soldier fly larvae to help break down substances and chemical spills. When, it, when it's gotten broken down to a point that it's now just in the soil, and on top of the soil, they'll actually break some of that stuff down. So um, you can actually hear them and they're kind of chewing away, it's kind of weird, but really kind of a neat thing. So every year since, I've, at some point in the summer, I get black soldier fly larvae and they're just going to town. You know, thousands of them in there, it's amazing. So this is what you're going to get. Those of you that compost know, you get a really rich, crumbly um, material out of it. It's a couple of more comment, uh, comments for you about composting. If your compost stinks, it's too wet. And it, it will, at some point, it'll get too moist. If it gets too moist, it smells bad. Compost shouldn't smell bad. If it smells bad, add some shredded newspaper, add some uh, wheat straw, add leaves. You need to add browns to it. And every now and then, I, you know, we're all busy. I lose track of mine. And I'll go down there one day and I'll go to add something to it and it's like, Phew, it smells awful. That's a sign that you need to add more brown material. You've got too much green stuff in there. It's easy to do. That's really all you've got to do. If it stinks, it's not working. If it's too dry, it's not going to break down very fast, but it doesn't stink. Uh, if, if it just looks like nothing's happening, you may have too much brown stuff. You might need to add more green material to it. But that's not very often the problem, really. And so the finished product is going to smell really sweet. I don't know how to describe Those of you that compost know this. When it's really finished, it, it's a sweet, earthy smell. And it's really loose and crumbly. And you can use it just like it is. But some people like to build a screen, and you would get hardware cloth, and put some hardware cloth on a frame, and put that frame over a bucket or over a wheelbarrow or something, and then pour some compost onto it, and then start shaking that frame. And what you're doing is screening out the big chunks have it broken down quite far enough, and then put those back in your compost. You don't have to, but it really gives you, if you do that, it really gives you a really fine textured compost that you can add to your garden. But don't nothing, you want that, the, the largest clumps to help keep your soil loose? You, you, doesn't matter, you can, it will, it'll, and it'll break down too. Some people just really like to go ahead and, and finish composting that stuff on down, but it, it doesn't matter one way or the other. Uh, if you want a really fine, pure, uh, fine grain compost, then screen it, if it doesn't matter to you, I don't screen mine, but, but you can either way. Okay, you're going to be, you're going to be adding uh, organic matter to your soil. Um, you're going to be composting. You're going to be using cover crops. You're going to be putting leaves on your soil. You're going to be out right in the neighborhood, stealing the leaves off your neighbor's yards, and piling them up behind your house. And so most, most people would do a conventional garden. And by conventional garden, I mean, it's, let's say, the size of this room. And every year you roll until the whole thing or you have somebody come do it for you. And you turn all the soil up and you lay out your rows and you plant. And that's what I used to do. And I just got tired of rototilling this whole thing. And then I learned that it's really not necessary and it's actually harmful. So what I did, uh, after some research and talking to people, I went to raised beds, permanent raised beds, which I highly recommend. Um, and we'll talk more about raised beds here as we go along. Well, let's get into what raised beds are first, then we'll get into some advantages of raised beds. Um, one thing raised beds allow you to do, when you, when you add organic matter to your conventional garden, there's nothing wrong with that, it works. And you're just putting organic matter right here in this garden you're standing in, and you roll it to it, like you kind of, it's kind of, uh, I guess, spread all over the garden rather thinly. What I like to do is do a raised bed, and I put that compost or those leaves or that whatever I'm adding, organic matter, into that bed where the garden's growing, and that raised bed, and it stays there. It's not gonna get spread out. It's not gonna get dissolved and uh, it'll spread over the entire garden. I'm not worried about the paths. Think about it, when you have a garden, at least half of your garden is where you're walking. At least half of it. And I don't wanna spend a lot of time trying to add you know, nutrients to that, and till that, and weed that. So, I'm gonna focus just on where I'm growing the crops. 
And so if you use raised beds, you can contain your organic matter that you're working so hard to make and so hard to add to that soil over the years. Um, raised beds don't have to be contained. They can be as simple as raking up the soil where you're going to plant in an area higher than the paths. And so you've got, you know, typical conventional garden, something like that. I like to make it more permanent. Um, however, don't use, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, don't use pressure-treated lumber because some of the chemicals in pressure-treated lumber aren't labeled for contact with food, and food is what's coming out of your garden. Um, I use cedar. You can also use regular pine from the hardware store, but if you do, treat it with a natural um, oil, linseed oil, tongue seed oil, something like that to preserve it, help make it water resistant. I used pressure-treated lumber on mine, but then I used to be in the construction business, so I went back and lined it with aluminum. That works. Uh, or, um, that way it lasts longer. Yeah, you can do that. You can use regular lumber and line it with something that's food safe to keep from leaching chemicals out of the wood into your soil. Uh, or you can just go get pressure-treated lumber and be done with it. Uh, there's a place uh, called Grant, G-R-A-N-T, Cedar Mill, and it's in Alexandria, not that an hour from here, maybe. I just know what the buy 40, you know what the buy is. Grant Cedar Mill. They've got a website, and they sell dimensional lumber, cedar lumber, and that's what I use. They've got two grades if you do go. One grade's more finished grade, I forget what they call it. It's for like furniture and using in your home. Then they've got a rough cut grade, and that's what I use. Uh, all of their, all their lumber is eight feet long. That's the only length they sell, but they sell different widths and thicknesses. So as a result, all of my beds are eight feet long, which is just a good working size. So I, I recommend um, I recommend cedar. And if you want to seal it with tongue seed oil or linseed oil or something, you can, or use it like it is. I just use it like it is. Eventually, it's going to rot, but it's not going to be an occasional board. It's not going to be everything at one time. So here's just some examples of raised beds. Um, one on the left, that's just dimensional lumber. Looks like a two by, maybe a two by 10. Um, on the one on the right, it's cedar. It's rough cut cedar. Uh, the one on the right there, of course, is cinder block. So that one was interesting. That's, that's actually in a, um, as you can see, it's between the curb and the sidewalk outside of a restaurant in Chattanooga that we went to. And I thought, how cool is this? They were growing vegetables to use in the restaurant. It was a little, little coffee sandwich shop. Um, one thing about the height, I think I, I may be getting ahead of myself. There's different reasons for doing raised beds. For me right now, the reason for doing a raised bed is to contain organic matter. Uh, that bed also drains a little bit better and warms up faster, so you can get in there and plant a little earlier in the spring than you can if it was just ground level. Um, but also as we age, you know, our knees, our hips, and our backs start going. It's inevitable. And I'm starting to have back trouble now. So if you want, if your reason for, for a raised bed is just to contain organic matter, <clears throat> my room is six inches tall. And that's all I need. So all I want to do is just keep that organic matter in. So I put that box down, basically different sizes. Some are two feet by eight feet, some are four feet by eight feet, and I've got some four by four. It's kind of a, an experiment with different sizes. So really all I need is about just, just enough to contain organic matter, six inches. That's actually it's full of six inches. That's actually big enough, deep enough, just to contain organic matter. So the plants are actually growing down into the soil, uh, and I'm just, I just want to keep that stuff, that matter, together. If your reason, however, for raised beds is because it's hard for you to get down to the ground, you want to go about 18 inches tall. That's chair height. This is, these chairs are sitting in, if you measure that, it's about 18 inches. And so if you go up about 18 inches tall, then you can sit on the edge and do your gardening by hand, and it's easier on your backs that way. So it depends on your reason. What a lot of people do, like I've done, I've started with six inch tall beds just to contain organic matter. But as time goes by, I can add another layer. 12 inches and then eventually 18 inches and uh, have something that I can sit on in the garden. So uh, consider doing raised beds. It's, it's really pretty easy. If you need some help, find some help. People are glad to help do things like that. It's not complicated. I don't stake them into the ground. I just put the, I screw the boxes together. I don't nail them. Use wood screws and I just lay them on the ground. <clears throat> and then what I did was, it was a conventional garden, so it was a big bare place, you know, like typical conventional gardens. So I laid out my beds. And then I just scooped dirt from between the rows into the beds. I didn't bring in any dirt. And so another thing, when people build raised beds, they have a tendency to think that they need to fill it all the way to the top right away. So they go spend a lot of money buying dirt, having the dirt hauled in to fill that bed or potting mix. We won't have to. 
mean, the plants are going to grow down to the soil no matter how big it is. You just you can get get by with just adding soil and organic matter as you get it. If you want to fill it to the top, that's fine. Go ahead and do that, but you don't have to. <clears throat> so that's kind of what we all strive for. Uh, I don't know where this is, but it's a beautiful garden. Uh, all raised beds. They're all looks like they're probably about three or four feet wide. And these are pretty long. They're also incorporating pots in there. Um, and there's a couple of different ways to address the pass between the raised beds. One is wood chips, which is what I use. You still get stuff growing in the wood chips. You still have to do some weeding. Um, I'm beginning to serve to consider grass pads. Uh, everything has an advantage and disadvantage. You don't weed a grass pad. All you do is make sure it's wide enough to run a push mower through. But the one thing you won't have to do probably is periodically go around the weed eater and just trim. So what you can't mow doesn't grow over into your bed. But it's pretty low maintenance, I think. What I do with mine is I let the landscape fabric down. Yeah. Then gravel. Gravel. So that, gravel. that works too. It um, heats it up <clears throat> faster. Mm -hmm. you know, so I, I can actually have three seasons of growing. And you're pretty weed free, except what falls on maybe on the gravel and germinates. That's another way to do it. I should get a slide of gravel pads. I've got wood chip pads. Um, you always have to add every year, you've got to add more wood chips, and stuff grows in wood chips. Mm -hmm. So I have to do some weeding. I may eventually wind up just going with going the grass. And excuse me, that's an interesting <clears> thing. You <throat> said you still get some weeds. I heard, and this is, would this be considered organic? that just pouring a vinegar on weeds works to kill the weeds, but is that still organic? Yeah, yeah. And vinegar, you can use vinegar to control tender, primarily tender annuals. It's not as good on a hardy perennial, but you can actually spray it, put it in a spray bottle. And But to me, it's by the time you get that spray bottle of vinegar and you bend over and just spray that thing, and then you probably have to come back and do it again, it's almost easier to pull over and bend over and pull it up. Oh. Or or just chop it with a hoe. But I do all my weeding, almost all my weeding with a hoe. Uh, I've got a, a diamond tipped hoe that I use to turn the beds and to chop weeds. And I, I've been using it for a long time. I've got very efficient with, <laughs> with, with the hoe. And, but yeah, you can use vinegar. And well, it, 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 will, on, it was on one of the yeah. local gardening mm -hmm. shows, I Volunteer think, gardener. said that, yes. Yeah. And they, I it thought, works. wow, I've been buying that horrible mm -hmm. stuff. <laughs> Yeah, you can, you, you, can use, you can also use corn gluten. You can buy corn gluten meal at the co-op and spread that out in your pads. It's a natural, uh, it's a natural um, germination suppressant, pre-emergent weed control. It's fairly effective. Um, you can use that. Can Just make sure you don't yard? put it. Hmm? Can you use that in your yard? You can, you can use it. Start? Yes. In fact, um, I've got a, I think I've got... I'm never going to get through all of this. If this runs longer than you guys have time for, feel free to leave or work my fingers because it's always, this always goes longer than, let's see if I can find that. In the back, there's a section on organic lawn care. We're not going to get there. There's a book by a guy named Paul Tuckey, T-U-K-E-Y. Um, there's also a couple of websites. Let's see, it's page... Oh, I got page 12. Page 12. Organic lawn care. Okay, Okay, yeah, page 12. There's some stuff there on um, organic lawn care that you might look at. There's some references there. Uh, bottom left corner of page 12, organic lawn care. There's some resources, safer lawns, um, organic lawn care, and the Rodell. Uh, so those you might look at. The book in the very back, I think, I've got a list of books. Okay. Um, there's a book by a guy named Paul Tuckey, a very, very good book. The book is about organic lawn care. Uh, you can incorporate as little or as much of that as you want just to reduce your dependence on chemicals. But it also has good information about composting, making compost tea, which we'll get to in a minute, I hope. Um, just, just a good book. I, I highly recommend that one. How did I get off on that? What, what was the question that got me started on that? <laughs> Vinegar, yes. Vinegar works. In a spray bottle, you can just spray it on the plant, but you'll probably have to apply more than once. But to me, I, I can come by and in like three seconds, I can use my hoe and it's gone. So either way, whatever works. And with the long handle hoe, I'm not bending over a lot to pull because it's hurts after a while. Harvesting rain, rainwater. And I'll try to speed up and, and blow through this stuff. Um, again, make sure it's a if you get a barrel, it's a food grade barrel, not a petroleum barrel that had cleaning solvents in it or oil or whatever. 
Again, I use the same barrel from Co-op myself, and I want to show you that again. Um, you need to position that barrel, whether you buy it at the store or you make it under a downspout. You've got to cut the downspout off and put an elbow on it to have it. And I'll show you a picture in a minute to get it to go into your rain barrel. Be sure you have an overflow because it will overflow. <clears throat> 55 gallons of water is not much. Well, I've got three at a time connected to each other. I do too. So they and they still going. overflow. Yep. Uh, you'll get a lot of water off your roof. Um, there's also a publication out there, I think, on rain gardens. And I'm not even going to get into that. But think about a rain garden. And there's a rain garden behind the pavilion back there. Uh, it's a good way to treat water coming off your roof before it hits the storm sewer. Um, be sure to direct your overflow away from your house so you're not putting water against your foundation. And be sure and put a screen over the top of the barrel to keep insects, particularly mosquitoes, out. Otherwise, you're breathing mosquitoes, which is not very cool. Um, elevate your rain barrel on blocks or something, because the higher the rain barrel is, the more pressure you've got at the hose coming out or at the spigot itself. <coughs> and again, be sure you're using the plastic food grade barrels. If you can, place your rain barrel on the east or north side of your home. It's just going to keep it from getting so hot. If it's on the north side, it's going to get pretty hot. It's going to grow a lot of algae. If it's on the west side, it's going to get... If it's on the south side, it's going to get hot. If it's on the west side, it's going to get hot. Try to place it on the north or east side of your house. Um, at the end of the season, be sure and clean your rain barrel. Take it down, clean it out. I use a like seventh generation or some kind of plant-derived cleaner. But I, we use organic stuff in the house. But use some kind of you know, harmless uh, soap, liquid soap, <coughs> put it back together. Most people will leave them unhooked during the winter. Do you all do that? Do you disconnect yours in the winter? Okay. I, I don't either, but they recommend you disconnect it because it could be damaged when it freezes, particularly with a really, really hard winter. So it's a good idea to get the water out of that barrel and leave it empty throughout the winter. Um, so here, as you had, you had a point about how much water comes off the roof. This was out in front of Whole Foods. They, rain, they, they sell rain barrels. Uh, I think they're like $100, you can build one for like $35. Um, but if you don't want to build one, you can buy one. Half inch of rain on a 1,000 square foot roof, which is not a very big roof, when you have 650 gallons of water, that's in one, in one half inch rain. And that's just an amazing amount of water. And obviously, if you've got a, I've got three 55 gallon rain barrels, kind of like you did. You said you had a 250 gallon barrel, you're not going to catch all the water. You're going to have to have a huge system to do that. And it's kind of interesting how, how vogue and how, you know, how in rain har water harvesting is now. But our grandparents' houses back in that era, they all had cisterns. And that's where the water came from. They had a well or they had a cistern or both. The water was collected off the roof, directed into the cistern, and then pumped into the house. So it's nothing new. It's just coming back around again. So here's a basic setup for those of you that maybe haven't done this. <clears throat> this is for a single barrel. And one thing I, I will say, I, this is mine, and I started off with one barrel. And I realized real quick that it wasn't enough water. It was gone like that. I used it up in no time. Um, added another one, still wasn't enough water. And the third barrel, still not enough water. So um, the one disadvantage to having the barrels hooked up, rather than, say, several single barrels, is it's a lot more work to take that thing apart, to disassemble all those parts and clean it than it is for a single barrel. So. If I had it to do again, I would probably just do more than one single barrel of different downspouts rather than having to take all this stuff apart. But you've got, typically your rain barrel is going to be under a downspout. I wanted mine in this corner here to protect it from the wet, from the sun. So I just put a couple of elbows on it and turned it. And normally it's going to sit right under your barrel. Um, you're going to put a screen over the top to keep insects out. You're going to put a spigot in the bottom. Real simple, and you're going to put an overflow right here. And the thing about I like about these barrels, these these are olive barrels from Spain. I like these a lot because the way they're designed, the top of it is a two-piece lid, kind of like a mason jar, a canning jar. So this this raised part comes off, and that flat part stays there. But that's like the the lid that you use when you can. So pull this off, that stays on there. Pull that off, and then the thing is open. But what you can do is because this is raised up so high. It acts as a natural catchment, so it almost it, it funnels the water into the barrel. So what I do, and I learned this. This was built uh, with uh, Robert Haley in the Memphis Bar Stormwater Program. Put on rain barrel workshops, so and he built that his workshop, first one I ever built. Just cut a hole out and put a window screen on it, and it's as simple as that. So if you're interested in building a rain barrel, you can go online, just search 
how to build a rain barrel, and you'll get tons of, of designs. I think there's a design out here that Murphy's Bar Stormwater Program has. It's very easy to do. You can also buy them, and I'll show you a couple here. Uh, oh, one word of caution. <laughs> go back to this. I, tend to, I put this spigot in the nearer the bottom because I wanted to try to get as much water out of the barrel as I could when I used it, not thinking it that through very well. Um, it's a long way from here to here, and you've got to put a washer and a grommet inside of there. So once I realized that, I spent about an hour in the backyard rolling around with this thing, trying to figure out how, what position, body position, to be able to reach that and tighten up the nut in there. So unless you've got some small children, you can send in there to do that for you. You might, if you build one, you don't put it way down there. Come up a little bit and don't worry about maybe getting all the water. That was, that was one of those life lessons. That was really hard and it was hot that day. So anyway, here's some homemade rain barrels. People get pretty creative with them. Uh, this one has a rain chain, and I believe it was a rain chain over at the pavilion you can look at. Uh, this is a more traditional. They use a flexible spout to kind of move the barrel around so it's not right out on the corner of the house. And people paint them up and get pretty creative with them. You can also buy them um, pre-made, Lowe's, Home Depot, you know, everybody sells rain barrels now. Um, I've got a picture too I need to put in here of a guy that, that built one and then put a hand pump on like a well mm -hmm. pump on top of it. So instead of okay. a spigot at the bottom, he just pumps it and pumps the water out. It's kind of deep. I need to add in here. Okay, any questions on rain barrels? It's easy to do. Easy to do. But you want to go buy one and set it up. But one word of caution about um, rain barrel water, and I skipped over that. Um, some studies suggest that you should not apply rain barrel water directly on the parts of fruits and vegetables you're going to eat. So like watery lettuce, um, kale, you know, anything that you're going to put water directly on the plant and underneath the plant, they recommend not using rain water for that. So once I did some research on that, I, I used air conditioner water, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, for those, and then I used this water, rain barrel water, to put around plants where I'm not eating the part of the plant that's being watered. Tomato plants, pepper plants, um, you know, cabbage where I'm watering the ground, not the plant itself. So be cautious. There's some concerns about bird droppings, algae growth, uh, chemicals off the roof, chemicals out of the rain gutter. So um, there, there's, if you like me, you've got lots of things growing in your yard. There's plenty of places to put rainwater, shrubs, potted plants, uh, lots of places to use it. So there's another. There's another source of water. Anybody harvest air conditioner water? Do you? Oh, cool. What, how do you do that? What do you? Well, it's a <coughs> my uh, where it comes out is up pretty high. Yeah. You can put a garbage can under that. That's <coughs> you're lucky. Not many people have the outlet up high, and we'll talk about that. Your air conditioner. I did not realize until I started doing this how much pure distilled water comes out of your air conditioner in the summer, particularly in July, August, and September. You'll get somewhere between 5 to 15 gallons of water. When I say 5 to 10 gallons there. On a really hot, humid day, I'll get 15 gallons of water every day. And that's pure distilled water. That goes on the lettuce and the kale and the chard and things like that. Is it like drinkable? Yes, it's distilled water. Yep. Mm, yep. Not only actually drink it, but it's safe to put on your plants. And it's probably safe to drink. It's distilled water. And so, you know, you may have... So let me get into this real quick. You've got, um, so somewhere on your house, you've got, everybody's got an air conditioner, right? And there's two different kinds of systems. One is called a package system where everything is outside. And if you've got a package system, then somewhere in that unit, there's a little piece of white pipe that'll come out and go like that. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And that's discharging condensation. It's discharging water. There's a split system where the, the condenser, the compressor is outside and upstairs in your attic is the condenser. That's where the water is made. And in those kind of systems, that piece of pipe goes across your attic to the exterior wall, goes down the wall, and most of the time it comes out at the ground, through the brick, through the siding, what have you. Occasionally you'll find a house where it comes out higher up. Mine comes out higher up, just by coincidence, and yours does too. Easy to harvest that water. But most of you are going to find either a package system where the water discharge is at the ground by the unit, or it's a split system and the discharge is at the ground somewhere on an exterior wall. So what you've got to do is 
get if it's a package system, just put an extender on that. It's, it's no pressure on the pipe. It's just drip water, just gravity flow. Make sure you don't block that pipe, whatever you do, because you'll flood your house. Um, but extend it away from your air conditioner or away from the foundation, just far enough to dig a hole, mm -hmm. deep enough to put a five-gallon bucket in, and then put some gravel in the bottom of the bucket, just so it doesn't get to be a muddy mess. Set your bucket down there, and your pipe is dripping into that bucket. And it's just, if you look at it, it's a drip, 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 drip. But you will get 5, 10, 15 gallons of distilled water a day. It's very easy to do. And we'll skip ahead. Just be careful that you don't block it. That, that would be a problem. Um, so here's, it's kind of a messy looking thing, a lot going on right here. This is a split system. This is the compressor upstairs. This is the condenser. So like your house, for whatever reason, the builder, we had this house built. I didn't know this at the time or I would have done it even better. But the discharge, these pipes come out the wall. You'll have that on your house somewhere. It originates at the compressor in the attic. Fortunately, it came out above the foundation blocks. Most of the time, it's going to come out down here on the ground, in which case that's where you have to extend it out and dig a hole. So this bucket's full. That's like a seven-gallon bucket. It was a bird food bucket, kind of a weird size. That's full, and this is one day, and it's day's not over yet. It's still filling that one. So um, during, during the part of the year when we're making water, I'm using that on, on tender greens and things that I don't want to put the um, rain barrel water on, I'm using the rain barrel water everywhere. And then if I just run out, I just use tap water. But this is softer water, it's better for your plants, and it's easy to do. That's extremely easy to do. Just find some little elbows and some pieces of half-inch PVC pipe, and just kind of whatever it takes to get it where you can collect it. Okay, um, 